How cool has it been that we've been exploring what it's been like with Jesus going to the cross? Who's enjoyed the last three or four weeks? Yeah, it's been so good. Thank you, team. We're going to continue this journey. And um, I'm really excited because we're going to look back now. We have the privilege of being this side of the cross thousands of years later. And we get to look back at what the disciples um, had coming for them, which they were totally oblivious to, in a sense. And, and we're going to dive into the book of Acts today and begin to look at what it was that, that happened next and how Jesus, Jesus came back and Jesus returned. And, and I want you all to have in your, in, in your mind at this time of Jesus has just been crucified and placed into a tomb. And we heard last week how he screamed out, It is finished. And at that moment, the curtain in the temple broke, split in two. And the disciples saw Jesus get taken down off the cross and slid into a tomb. And what must they have been thinking at that point of time? This is our saviour. This is the Messiah. This is the guy that was meant to restore Israel. Like what's, what just happened? In the final two chapters of John, Jesus appears to Mary. He appears to his disciples. He appears to Doubting Thomas. And one of my favourites is when he appears again to the disciples while they're fishing. And he reinstates Peter. Remember how when Jesus was going to the cross and Peter denied him three times? Well, here... Jesus asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And his response is, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. But three times, isn't it just amazing how it just takes out the denial and he reinstates him. You love me, do you love me, do you love me? Then do this, then do this, then do this. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Oh, I love the book of Acts. I'm not going to... Here's a disclaimer, right? Because we go into the book of Acts, I'm not going to claim that I know anything about it, okay? Because it just blows my mind every time I study it. And the very tiny little bit that I know is nothing in comparison to what it actually says. So I'm going to try... And I'm just going to read scripture because that's the best thing to do, isn't it? Let Holy Spirit do his thing, right? Because that's his job, not mine. All right, so let's go. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Um, now, Acts was written by Luke. And, uh, and this is where Luke is saying in my former book, um, and he's talking about the book of Luke, okay? Um, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do in teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to the men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Over 40 days. Can you just imagine just being a disciple and being feeling a little bit defeated that what just happened to our Messiah, this guy that I've been walking with and who said all these and did all these marvellous, wonderful things and taught me all this stuff and he's gone. Then all of a sudden, he appears. Now, he doesn't just appear in the spirit form. He appears in flesh. They can touch him. He sits and eats with them and drinks with them. And then before their very eyes, he vanishes. So, and then he comes back again. And for 40 days, he just spoke kingdom to, to them. It was like 40 days of intense training for the disciples of what was coming next. And what did they need to know? They needed to know about the kingdom of God. As if the last three years wasn't enough. They just walked with Jesus for three years. And now they've got 40 days of intensive Bible study with Jesus, learning about the kingdom of God. Because of what's coming next. And John finishes his book in chapter 21 and verse 25 and says that Jesus did 
many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, suppose that not even the whole world would have enough room for the books that would be written. Just ponder that for a moment. This is one book that we have with lots of books in it, right? But in my lifetime, I could study this 24-7 and still not have enough time to understand it all. Because there's so much depth and detail to it, yet everything else that Jesus did that wasn't recorded that we could still learn from, there would be not enough books to be able to capture everything that he actually did. Oops. And I just like to think that the, the excitement within the disciples would have just been like ecstatic. Having Jesus with them after they've seen him crucified, after they've seen him handed over to the rulers and authorities to be crucified, after they've seen him be whipped and beaten beyond recognition, and then he disappears because he's risen. And he's telling them the good news about the kingdom of God and and what's coming next. That would have been a buzz. That would have been like, man, this is the best ever. Jesus, he came back. Our Messiah is here. Yes, Israel is going to be restored like the promises. This is so exciting. Wow, that's why I can't wait to go and tell people. Oh, man, do you know what just happened? What I just saw... And I thought there was hopelessness now. There is nothing but hope. That's just like, wow! For the buzz in the room, every time Jesus is sitting there talking and Jesus appears like, oh, Jesus, you're back again! Yes! All the doors are shut, but you're right here! And I can touch you! And Thomas puts his hands in his side. This is where I was pierced. Man, imagine what that would have been like. In the final book of Luke, uh, chapter of Luke, I want to read that because Luke finishes his book in Luke and then starts Acts right at the same spot. So he picks up where he left off from. And apparently the scribes that they would write these things down on were only a certain length. So it's believed that Luke got to the end of the scribe that was being written and had to start a new one, and that's why the book of Acts was a different book in a sense. But it just follows on. It's really cool. So let's go to Luke 24, 44 to 53 we're going to read. Well, this is fun. I'm going to read it from the screen. Just realised what I did wrong. I was looking at Luke 24, 24. I'm like, that doesn't say what I've got up there. What have I done? Okay, 44, here we go. He said to them, this, oh, I appreciate you so much. He said to them, this is what I told you why I was still with you. Everything that must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses to the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. How cool is that? That He's just like, guys, you need to get this. I'm going to supernaturally open your mind so you can receive what I'm about to tell you. Oh, it's so cool. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, which they've all witnessed, right? And repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Where are they at the moment? In Jerusalem. Right? Really, really cool. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Oh, come on, how cool is that? All right. Let's go back to Acts. Here we go. Acts 1, verse 4.
on one occasion while he was eating with them. He gave him this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus must have been going, guys, get your head off of Israel for a minute and on the moment right now. Because that's not what I'm talking about. And yet, because we have to understand that that's what these guys are all thinking, that this is the end goal. So this must be what's going to happen. Oh, you've told us all about this, Jesus. This is what's going to happen. No, they've jumped right to the end. Right? No, that's not what's happening just yet. And he says to them, It is not for you to know the time or date the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, guys, you're not going to know it all. And the Father's not going to reveal it all to you. And we're not going to know it all. And the Father's not going to reveal it all to us. Isn't that a humbling experience? When you realise that. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jerusalem was where they were, where they were at the temple. And then Judea and Samaria was then surrounded by Jerusalem. And then the ends of the earth was then the ends of the earth. Right? And you'll be my witnesses. You'll be witness of Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you then will be the witness of who Jesus is. Oh, I think that's really, really cool. After he said this, he was taken from before their very eyes and in a cloud hid from their sight. Do you reckon they just stood there in wonder? All right? As they're just watching, and next thing Jesus just starts in his bodily form, up he goes, they'll be going, Where are you going? Where are you doing? And then it goes on to say the angels then appeared. They were looking up intently into the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? I think it's pretty obvious why they're standing there looking into the sky. <laughs> All right. But what are the angels saying? Take your focus off Jesus. He's, he's gone now, but focus on what he's just told you. The same Jesus that has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Why did Jesus ask them to stay? Why did, they ask, why did he ask him to wait? Why didn't Jesus just go, right, I'm going now, guys. And as I go up into the heavens, the Holy Spirit now is going to be sent down upon you, right here, right now, and off you go. Wouldn't that have been just the easy thing to do? That's probably the way I would have done it. Obviously, the reason why I'm not God. (laughs) But that was... What sort of obedience is there in that? What sort of obedience is there in waiting? Did he tell them how long it's going to take for them to receive the Holy Spirit? No, he said, stay here, don't go anywhere, and wait. Who loves to wait? Right? They're waiting because they're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. What's going to be more effective if they go out in their flesh now that they know and they've seen and they've witnessed it all and in that excitement they're now going to go tell everyone what they've just seen and what they've just witnessed and, and this amazing, amazing experience of seeing Jesus, the Messiah, crucified, 
put into the tomb, risen again, come amongst me. I touched him after he was dead and risen. And he spoke to us and he ate with us and he drank with us. And man, it was amazing. This guy, he's the Messiah. Or is it more powerful to wait for the Holy Spirit, God, to come and empower you than to go and do the work of Christ? We could try and do it in our flesh. They could have just gone. They, they could have not listened to the wait here for it and just gone and gone, no, man, I've got this, let's go. And who do we know that um, didn't wait in, in Scripture? Saul. Huh? Saul didn't wait. So in First Samuel 13 is where you can read about the story of Saul, and, and he didn't wait. He was meant to wait seven days for Samuel to get back, and he didn't. Instead, he decided that he was going to make the offering because Samuel was running late. So it's been seven days. Right, we need to make this offering. Let's get it done. I waited seven days. Samuel's not here. Right, I'm going to make the offering. And he was a king, so a king could do whatever he wants. Right? that actually showed weakness. It showed weakness because it showed that he was impatient and he relied on his self-reliance rather than on God. His offering showed that he didn't want to work with Samuel, that his regard for Samuel was so low that if you're not here, buddy, too bad, I'm going to do it myself. He wasn't willing to be part of the team. He wasn't willing to obey God and the structure God had put in place. And he's got, no, man, I got this. Rather, he wanted to take control of the situation himself. But the king was to follow the Lord's commandments, just as we are. Yet Saul felt that he could choose. It didn't end well for Saul. So I encourage you, check out that story if you don't know it. You know, things that Jesus asks us to do are hard. Who enjoyed isolation? Who's been in isolation? Uh, most people in the room have, have experienced isolation. Who found that lots of fun? A huh? couple of people. Excellent. <laughs> isolation can be really hard. Now, in this instance, they went back together to Jerusalem and they waited with everyone else, right? So they weren't so isolated, but they couldn't go with the good news that they had, right? They had to wait. And that would have been hard, don't you reckon? Well, you put yourself in their shoes. I reckon, man, if if that was me, I would have been itching to get out and go and tell people. Itching, going, man, I've just witnessed the most amazing thing ever and now you're telling me to wait. I don't want to wait. I want to go. I want to do things. I like doing stuff. I don't like sitting around. Right? But instead, no, they were obedient. Jesus said to wait. So we're going to go back to Jerusalem. We're going to go to the temple. We're going to wait. And what did they do while they waited? They praised God. They prayed and they worshipped. When Jesus asks us to do things, sometimes it's hard. The things that Jesus asked the disciples to do was hard. To forgive one another, hard. To forgive your enemies, harder. To lead people, hard. To establish the church. You read about how hard it was for them to establish the church and the persecution they came under. And the death that they endured, hard. You've got to be obedient to be able to do the hard things. Heal the sick, drive out demons, take the kingdom of God everywhere that you go. It's hard. All of it's hard. None of it is an easy road. All of it is hard. The disciples showed us a pattern of obedience to Jesus Christ to follow even when it's hard. And I think we can really take... I just love it, you know? Just, just grasp it and go, I just want to let go of this. This is the example they've shown me. This is how I want to live my life. 
I want to live in obedience to Christ like the disciples were in obedience to Christ. Acts 2, verse 1 to 2, when the Spirit came. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, imagine that. Imagine we're all just here and then all of a sudden the ground shakes and there's this earthquake and then the wind just comes rushing through the place. Imagine what that would have been like. Man. When did the Spirit come? On the day of Pentecost. 50 days after the Passover. What else happened 50 days after the Passover? How about in Exodus, where Moses went up to the mountain and got the law? And he came down 50 days after Passover to give the law to God's people. In both instances, we've got wild weather, we've got fire, and we've got the gathering of all the people. Right? In Exodus, when Jesus was on Jesus, when Moses was on the mountain, they were partying. They were not honouring God. And when Moses came down with the law and found them this way, what happened? Three thousand of them died. Because of their disobedience to God. Yet in Acts, the people went back. And how did, how did Jesus find them? How did the Holy Spirit find them? In prayer and in worship. And what happened next? 3,000 people were baptized and saved. Come on, how exciting is that? Yeah. When we are obedient to Christ, when we are obedient to His way, when we are obedient... And we, and we go, man, you just, we're just going to come together in this time. We're going to worship our King together. And we're going to devote ourselves to prayer. And we're going to devote our lives to staying where Jesus told us to stay until the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We've got no idea what that looks like. They wouldn't have had a clue. We know because we're on the other side. We get to read all about it. They would have no idea what that was going to look like. And Peter had to explain to the people around them that were all gathered, all these thousands of people around them that were witnessing the fall of the Holy Spirit that looked like tongues of fire resting on their heads. And they were speaking in all these different languages. Remember in Genesis where God confused the human tongue and created all these different languages and spread confusion everywhere? Now he's brought it back again here in Acts with the interpretation where people can now speak in other languages, not even know they're doing it. Amazing. And Peter's had to explain to the people that were around what had just happened. Guys, you sent Jesus. Remember, these are people that are in the tomb, right? So these are all people that are, are calling themselves followers of God, devoted to God, right? And he goes, Guys, you're the ones that sent Jesus Christ to the cross. You crucified him. But I tell you, he has risen. And he's explained to them what's happened. And then in Acts 2, 37 to 41... When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart... And said to Peter and the other disciples, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accept this message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But these people that he's speaking to, right? Baptism wasn't new to them. They'd already been baptised. They had to be baptised to be in the temple. So to be told to be baptised again, they're going, hang on, what? What are we being baptised into now? But what was new was to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. So what did it mean then to be baptised into the name of Jesus Christ? It meant that you become dependent on Jesus. These guys knew who Jesus was. They sent him to the cross. Now they had to turn from that and become dependent on Jesus. They had to give their allegiance to Jesus. They're taking on his name. They're taking on his character. Who he has been baptised. When you were baptised, you took on Jesus' name. You took on Jesus' character. You took on everything Jesus stands for. You took it on. I took it on. And now you and I are witnesses of him to the entire world. It's a pretty big ask, isn't it? Being baptised in the name of Jesus according to his power... His authority. He is over us. Our trust now becomes in Jesus and we become empowered by his Holy Spirit to proclaim the kingdom of God. Because in Acts 1, 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses, says Jesus. My witnesses. Do you realise how much of an honour and responsibility this is, church? This is like the biggest and most greatest thing you can do with your entire life. There is nothing else out there that can compare to being the witness of Jesus. Because who is he? His love. His kindness, his compassion, his gentleness, his self-control. He's the saviour of the entire human race. And you and I have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to get out there and be his witnesses and show the world who he is. And today we get to baptise Luca. And Luca's making the decision that she's saying that, I want this. I want this. I want to be Jesus' witness. And I want to be clothed with power from on high. It is so exciting. And I look forward to the days that we get to baptise more people in the house. And if we go down the front street and baptise people at the beach or wherever it is that we get to do this because we are witnesses. While we weren't there at the time, if I have the band up, While we weren't there at the time when all this stuff happened, we get to still be witnesses because God has made it known to us. Holy Spirit has made it known to us. He decided that each one of you here was enough to be Christ's witness in the community. And you've got all that it takes and you've got all that you need and you're more than enough. And he's calling you to a higher level and a higher power that is in his Holy Spirit. And when we go from here, we go filled in the Holy Spirit. And every day we have access to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have him empower us and him give us the words to say and him lead us into all areas and be devoted to being the witness of Jesus Christ and who he is, the risen Lord and King and Saviour of the world. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go out with a song and then we're going to have a coffee while we get the baptism pool ready. It'll only take about five or ten minutes and then we'll come back in and have a baptism. And if anyone else wants to be baptised that isn't baptised, come and see me. We'll baptise you as well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.